All summer long, we have been in a series about grace. Uh, Specifically, we are finding grace in unexpected places, and the unexpected place, in this case, is the Old Testament. A lot of us, when we think about God's grace, we don't think about the Old Testament because for many of us, the image of God in the Old Testament is that of a kind of a, a mean, vindictive, stern, judgmental God who looks forward to punishing people. And, and only in the New Testament does God kind of soften up and calm down and, and get more loving. But what we've been doing all summer is we've been looking at the stories of people who lived during the time that the Old Testament was being written, and we're seeing how they encountered this loving, compassionate, graceful, patient God. And we're learning what this has to do with us uh, today. And when we started the series... We defined grace, because grace can be defined in many ways, but we defined grace as being something that we get that we don't deserve, something that we have actively disqualified ourselves from. And and we said that the best way to really understand grace is to contrast it with justice and mercy. And and what we said, if you were with us week one, beginning of the summer, seems like a long time ago, but we said that justice is getting what I deserve, mercy is not getting what I deserve. But grace is getting what I don't deserve, what I've actively disqualified myself from. And so if I could use an illustration, maybe not a great illustration, but to illustrate, let's say that you have a teenager, and your teenager tragically dies in a car accident because another teenager made the decision to drink and drive and killed your teenager. It would be a tragic event for anyone to have to go through. And justice would say that the the teenager who made the mistake would need to go to jail and serve a very long term for what they have done. That's justice. They would be getting what they deserve. Mercy would say they're not going to get what they deserve. And so the parents drop charges and say the the kid made a mistake. He didn't mean to do what he did. I'm never going to talk to them again, but I'm just going to drop the charges. They're not going to have to go to jail. They're not going to get what they deserve. It's mercy. Grace, on the other hand, would say, you know what, you took my child from me, but I'm not only going to drop the charges and you're not only going to not go to jail, but I'm going to adopt you into my family and I'm going to make you one of my own children and I'm going to love you like my own child and I'm going to send you to college and I'm going to love you like a child the rest of my life and then when I die, I'm going to leave my entire estate to you. That would be grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is getting what we have actively disqualified ourselves from. But here's something that's true, I think, for all of us, whether you are a lifelong Christian or you're just kind of starting to explore Christianity for the first time and you're still skeptical about things. I think there's something that's true for all of us, and and that is there's something inside of us that screams, not for grace, but for justice, right? When, When we see some act of injustice playing out, there's something wired in all of us that demands the score be evened that the person who did the wrong unjustly get what they deserve. And we see this and we experience this in such a number of ways. It could be something as simple as watching that movie, you know, where the the villain keeps getting away with all of the bad things and they're just abusing people and then they're doing horrible things to people and they're getting away with it. There's no accountability. There's no punishment. And it's horrible to watch, but we keep watching the movie because we can't wait for the villain to finally get justice, right? And we hope it's going to be long and slow and painful, right? And so we wait because we have this thing wired inside of us that just desires justice. And so that's the way they write stories. I mean, story writers know that's the way we're wired. And so they give us kind of that payday at the end of the movie. Like, okay, everything is right in the universe. The bad guy got his, right? But it can be much more personal than watching a movie. You know, maybe... You had the great idea at work, and one of your coworkers steals the idea, gets the credit, gets the promotion, and gets away with it. That's the kind of thing that will drive us mad. Or something happens, and you tell the truth, and someone else tells a lie, and everyone believes the liar and calls you, the one who's telling the truth, a liar, and your reputation is ruined for telling the truth. It's unjust. And something inside of us screams that there be justice, and it drives us crazy. Or I do the right thing at great personal cost to myself. It is hard to do the right thing in this situation, but yet I get accused of doing the wrong thing, and I get punished. It's unjust, and it drives me nuts because something inside of me demands justice. Or 
it could even be the things that we see on the news every week. We see about injustice being done, people abusing and abusing their power to take from those who don't have power, and crimes being done against innocent people. A couple of, of rebel soldiers in Ukraine have a rocket launcher, and they bring down an entire flight full of innocent people, and those guys will probably be ne- never be brought to justice or never be punished. It drives us crazy. Or we hear about human trafficking happening, where kids get stolen from their families, never to be returned, or parents actually sell their children into human trade, and they all get away with it. And and if we're honest with ourselves, when we experience injustice, and that injustice meter starts tipping in our hearts, when we experience those things, all of us at times wonder why a loving and gracious God would allow these unjust things to happen. Why does he allow the unjust things to happen to me? Where was he when that happened? What was he doing? Why isn't he evening the score? Is he not fair? Or when we see great atrocities or injustices taking place that lead to incredible human suffering on the planet, we wonder, well, where is this loving all-powerful God. Why isn't he doing something? And it's, it's maddening. These are the kind of issues that drive us crazy, ties our stomach in knots, keep us awake at night, because inside of you and inside of me is something that demands justice. It's a part of our wiring. If people do something atrocious and get away with it, if they don't get what they deserve, it's maddening to us. And today, we're going to look at a story that is maddening. And so just get ready to get mad, all right? You probably didn't expect to come to church to get mad, but you're probably going to get mad if you have this internal justice, but hopefully we'll all end in a, a good place. Today we look at a story found in 1 Kings chapter 21, and it's the story of a king who ruled in Israel named Ahab. Kids, if you want to count how many times you hear me say the name Ahab, that's one right there, take that number to the back after the service in the foyer, we'll have something for you. Ahab, that's two by the way, Ahab, three, ruled Israel in the city of Samaria for 22 years. He's king for 22 years. And the ancient historian who wrote the book of 1 Kings said this about Ahab. This is just one place, but he did more things to make the Lord, the God of Israel, angry than all the other kings before him. So right from the beginning, we learn that Ahab is a bad dude. Ahab is evil. This is the same Ahab who married perhaps the most wicked woman who ever lived. And you probably, everyone's probably heard her name before. Jezebel, right? Yeah, that Ahab. Ahab and Jezebel, they were husband and wife. Ahab is the guy who brought idol worship into Israel and made it mainstream. He built temples to Baal and Astra and brought all of the wicked and vile practices that worshiping these gods kind of brought with them to Israel. Ahab allowed all of the prophets of God to be slaughtered. Didn't do a thing about it. Ahab was the arch nemesis of the great prophet Elijah. Ahab was a bad dude. And as we come to 1 Kings chapter 21, we're told that Ahab has a palace in Samaria and and he wants to do some renovating and some expanding. All right. And so Ahab, specifically, he wants to build a, a vegetable garden. Maybe he wants to live more healthy. I don't know. Maybe his chef is demanding herbs. But he wants a vegetable garden. But he doesn't have land for it in his palace. Enter Naboth. Naboth is a guy who's a, just a righteous man trying to live his life out and honor God and love his family. Naboth has a vineyard that's very close to Ahab's palace. And so Ahab approaches Naboth and he says, you know what? I could really use your vineyard. I'd like to expand. I'd like to build a vegetable garden. I'll tell you what. You give me your vineyard, and I'll give you a better vineyard somewhere else, or I'll give you money, whichever you prefer. All right. Well, what does Naboth do with Ahab's offer? He says in verse 3, he says, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Okay, great offer, but the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father. Why, why does he answer this way? What's going on here? Well, when the Israelites entered Canaan, 
all of the land of the promised land was divided up and divvied out according to tribe and according to family. And God said that that land inheritance would be an eternal inheritance that would belong to each family, to be passed down from generation to generation forever. And a person was never to sell or give away their family's property because that was their family's property given by God forever. So just consider what God said to Moses in Numbers chapter 36. He said, no inheritance in Israel is to pass from tribe to tribe, for every Israelite shall keep the tribal land inherited from his forefathers. Right? So this was a command of God. And so for Naboth, when Ahab comes to him and says, can I buy your vineyard, or can I give you another one, that would be disobedience to God. This was his family inheritance forever. This was to be passed on to his children and his children's children. And so we can see Naboth has a pretty good excuse for saying no. He's trying to honor God. How does Ahab respond? So Ahab went home sullen and angry. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. This is something we know about Ahab. If you read through 1 Kings, you know that Ahab is what we would call today a baby. He is a spoiled brat. We continually find Ahab sulking and pouting and throwing himself on his bed and burying his face in his pillow and refusing to eat because he's so upset. I mean, whenever he doesn't get his way, Ahab throws a temper tantrum. And so here is Ahab throwing a temper tantrum because he can't have Naboth's vineyard enter evil wife Jezebel. Jezebel comes on the scene and she sees Ahab and she says, What's the deal? Why are you so upset? Why aren't you eating? And Ahab tells the story. And he says, because I said to Naboth, the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard. Or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. <laughs> Do you notice what's missing from, Naboth's side of the sto- or from Ahab's side of the story? You notice some details are missing? And, and this is what we do when we're trying to get people on our side in a story and make ourselves look like villains. We tell all of our side and give all the details, but we kind of leave out the details from the other side of the story. He doesn't give the reason as to why Naboth said no, that he's trying to honor God and he can't give away his family inheritance and all that. No, 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 no. He just says, I I give him this great offer and he refuses. I just think it's funny because we still do that today. You know, if I want you on my side, I'm going to give you all of my details, make myself look good, but I'm going to leave out the details maybe of, of their side of the story. So whenever you hear a story, make sure you're saying, are there any details you're leaving out that maybe are pertinent to the story? I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't seem sympathetic, but you can get to the truth. All right. So this is what Nabot, or Ahab says to, to Jezebel. And, and, and so Jezebel is kind of like baffled that he's acting this way. So she says, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So this, this little inter- interchange, I think, does a lot to kind of contrast the different governments that were ruling in Canaan. Because Ahab is the king of Israel, which was a government that was established by God through his prophets. And Ahab knew he couldn't just take something by force or unjustly take Naboth's vineyard because he was being governed by covenantal law. God said the kings aren't any better than anybody else. They can't do whatever they want. They're not dictators. They're not tyrants. Right? And so that's the way God's government was. But Jezebel was a Phoenician. And she came from the surrounding kingdoms. And she had seen how the other kings reigned in Canaan. And when they wanted something, they took it. It didn't matter who they hurt or how unjust it was. They took what they wanted. They used their power. They abused their power at at the expense of their people. And so we have kind of a contrast here between the way Ahab responds and the way Jezebel responds. And this is just another reason as to why God said, when you enter the promised land, drive them out. Because these had been wicked, cruel, evil, violent people for centuries. And Jezebel had kind of grown up like that and had seen that. So she's going to supply a solution to the problem based on what she had seen from the surrounding kings. And so what she does is she, she, she gives a solution. She says, here's what we're going to do. And she goes and she gets Ahab's seal, and she, she writes a letter in his name to the leaders of Jezreel, where, where um, Naboth lived. And she says, I want you to call a sacred assembly, gather everybody in the village together, and I want you to put Naboth in a very prominent place, presumably a place of honor, 
And then I want you to bring in some worthless men. Some translations say some scoundrels. Bring in some scoundrels who will point Naboth out and say that they saw him blaspheming God and blaspheming the king, a crime that was punishable by immediate death. And that's what happens. She sends out the letters, and the plan starts to be played out. What a horrible plan, right? Just to get a vegetable garden. This is the way they were thinking. I want the vegetable garden. I don't care who dies. I'm going to get the garden. So the letters go out. The plan is implemented. Everything is going according to plan. The assembly is called. Naboth gets seated in the most prominent place. The two scoundrels come in. They point out Naboth. Hey, you're the guy we saw blaspheming God's name and blaspheming the king. This guy is an evil dude. And Naboth is like, what? Never done such a thing. I, I try to follow God. But the crowd is aghast, and they drag him outside of the city, planning to execute him. The good guy is going to get killed unjustly. Again, I mean, something inside of us, that internal justice meter starts going haywire when we read this story and we see it unfold. And here we're waiting. We're waiting for the hero to swoop in. And we're waiting for the hero to kind of foil the villain's plans and, and save the day and save righteous Naboth. That's a good story, right? And just this last week, I was watching one of those action movies. That the whole thing is like set on an airplane. So you're wondering, is the plane going to crash or is it so, some hero going to save the day? And at the beginning of the movie, there's a scene where a little girl with a stuffed animal gets on the plane. They really make a big deal about the little girl getting on the plane. So I said to the people I was watching the movie with, it's going to be a happy ending. I mean, everyone is going to live. There's no way the writers are going to kill off the innocent little girl, right? That would be a bad story. We would walk out of that movie. We don't want to see the innocent little girl die because that's good storytelling. But here in 1 Kings chapter 21, no one runs to Naboth's rescue. The righteous man, the innocent man, doesn't get justice. He gets unjustly murdered, accused of blasphemy, dragged outside the city, and stoned. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And in reality, if you look at the story in 2 Kings... They most likely not only killed Naboth, but they also stoned all of his sons so that no one would be around to inherit the vineyard and Jezebel and Ahab could go and take it by law. And that, again, that stirs something inside of us. I mean, doesn't it? That stirs something inside of me. To, to, to read about such abuse of power, to, to, to hear about such injustice. I mean, what words would you use to describe how you feel when, when you hear stories like that? I mean, anger indignation, uh, furious? Do, do, you, do you feel a sense of hatred at the injustice that's being done to innocent people? I know I do. But I'll tell you, Ahab doesn't feel any of that. His word comes to Ahab, what, what's happened? And, and look how Ahab responds. It says, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. He's thinking to himself, sweet, my wife took care of it. I get my vegetable garden after all. Life is good. I don't care what happened to anybody else. My life is good. I get my vegetable garden. He goes straight to the vineyard and he takes possession of it. So what's God going to do? Is God going to let Ahab get, just get away with this? Fortunately, no. God goes to the prophet Elijah and he says, I want you to go to, Na to, to Ahab and I want you to tell him that judgment is coming. I want you to tell him that he is going to die in the same way that Naboth died in the same place. that The dogs are going to lick up his blood in the same place where they licked up Naboth's blood. And so Elijah goes and he finds Ahab in Naboth's vineyard. And Ahab is there and he's caught red-handed. And Elijah gives this message to Ahab from God. And this is a part of it. He says, I am going to, this is God to, to, to Ahab, I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel. In other words, an eye for an eye. This is what you did to Naboth. This is what I'm going to do to you. Because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. Now this is the God that we know and think of in the Old Testament, right? All right. And now all of a sudden we love it. Yeah, we're glad God is just and powerful and that he can kind of bring the heat when people do bad things the way Ahab did. You know, now is where we love this part of the story. And we even like pull up a chair and we get our popcorn and we're like, oh yeah, 
God, don't wait. Bring the justice now. Let the fire fall on Ahab, and we'll just kind of enjoy it. You know, it's going to be good. This is good entertainment. Makes us feel good. It's a good story. Punish the bad guy. And, and, and if you aren't already convinced that Ahab deserves justice, the writer of 1 Kings throws in a parenthetical statement just to kind of convince us that he deserves this judgment. He says, there was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. Okay, again, like we don't already think Ahab deserves justice from God. Fine, now we're convinced. God, go ahead, go get him. I've got my popcorn, now let's get on with the judgment. But what happens next in the story is maddening and unexpected and incredibly amazing. Verse 27, when Ahab heard these words, the words of God through Elijah, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. So what, what's happening here? I mean, it means that when Ahab heard Elijah's rebuke and when he heard about the judgment that was coming on him and on his family, he felt sorry. Or if anything else, at least he felt afraid. And he regretted what he had done. And he repented. And you and I, we look at this and we see, you know, Ahab's crocodile tears. And we see him put on sackcloth and asses. And we're just like, oh, great. Save it, Ahab. None of us are buying it. God's not going to buy it. No one's buying it. You're just trying to save your rear end. You're going to get it. Okay, go, God. Now, get him. I mean, who cares that he's putting on sackcloth and ashes and going around meekly? But how does God respond to Ahab's repentance? God goes to Elijah the prophet and gives him another message. And this is what he says. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Are you kidding me? This is not a good ending. After everything Ahab has done, after all the lives he has destroyed, with no remorse whatsoever, he gets a message of judgment from God. The judgment is coming. And he throws on some sackcloth and ashes. And he says he's sorry. And he acts humble. And God says, good enough. Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that the score never gets settled? Are you telling me that Ahab humbles himself? And that's enough? I mean, it just amazes me that it even sounds like God is bragging about Ahab like a father brags about the son. Oh, have you seen how he's going around so humbly, how he's humbled himself before me? God, really, you're buying this? I'm just amazed that God would show grace in this circumstance. And, And really, though, I think that this is the point of the story. The point of the story is... While sin demands justice, our hearts demand justice. A humble heart always receives grace. A humble heart always receives grace. God can't turn away from a humble heart. Now we're going to unpack that in just a second. But let's just kind of go back to this one idea. I I think that maybe this is kind of lodged in some of our minds, this whole idea about bringing the judgment on his son and well, that doesn't seem very fair, does it? I mean, what about his son? What is he, what's going to happen to him? I mean, why does he have to suffer? And if God is saying that he, I mean, he's delaying judgment until his son comes along and then the son's going to get punished for Ahab's sin, then God would be saying he's going to be breaking his own law, okay? Because God had already said in, in the law that a child cannot suffer punishment for the sins of their parents. That goes against the principles of God. And so that's not what God is saying. God's not saying, well, I'm going to punish your son for your sin. What God is saying is, I'm going to delay judgment another generation. And a God this graceful and this merciful, if Ahab's son repents and has a humble heart, he too will surely receive grace. Right? So this isn't about, I'm going to get your son for what you have done. It's just like, I'm going I'm to hold off another generation. I'm going to let you live. I'm going to let you die. And then I'm going to bring the judgment. Unless, of course, they too humble their hearts. Right? But that won't be the case. If you want to read the rest of the story, it's really good. Read the rest of 1 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 1, you read what happened to his son. His son didn't humble 
himself. And you're finally like, yes, okay, justice. But the point, again, of the story is while sin demands justice, a humble heart always receives grace. And, and again, this is maddening to us. I mean, that a guy like Ahab can do what he did and then just humble his heart and tell God he's sorry and, and, and kind of get away with everything. And we wonder, what about Naboth? What about Naboth's family? And all of a sudden, we're not sure that we like this aspect of God, this graceful God who is so patient and so long-suffering. Again, like I mentioned last time, maybe the God of the Old Testament isn't too stern. Maybe the God of the Old Testament is too soft. Maybe he lets people get away with a little too much. Maybe if he was a bit more stern and gave a bit more judgment, people would have a bit more faith. Or certainly they would obey more. But here's the thing. You're following me here. We don't like seeing people get away with injustice. And, and we don't like seeing bad people receive grace. As long as those bad people are somebody else. When, when you do something unjust, or you abuse your influence, or you do something selfish, and take what doesn't belong to you, you should get what you deserve. You should get justice. But we don't see things the same way when we're the ones messing up and when I'm the one who's abusing my influence and taking what doesn't belong to me. When I mess up, when I break God's law, then all of a sudden something happens to that internal justice meter. When I mess up, all of a sudden grace doesn't look so frivolous. When I mess up, all of a sudden grace looks beautiful and marvelous. See, when, when we see injustice, we may wonder, where is God in the world? Why isn't God doing anything about that? Why isn't he dealing with those people who are doing those bad, mean, abusive things? But the reality is, if that were God's plan, if God's plan were to just kind of wipe people out as they do, did unjust things against others, I would be on his list. You would be on his list. Because we have all done bad things and abused our influence and taken what doesn't belong to us. So all of a sudden, I see this double standard. God, why don't you do something about them, those people doing horrible, corrupt, unjust things? Punish them. But when I mess up, God, please give me grace. I love grace. I know we could easily argue, but I'm no Ahab. Come on. I've never done anything close to what Ahab has done. And that's true. But that's what we do as humans. We put sin on a scale, and we put ourselves somewhere on that scale, and then we look at everyone below us on the scale, everyone worse than us, and say, okay, those are the people who demand justice, right? Everyone can say, well, at least I'm not as bad as, right? And when we run out of people, we always have Hitler. Hitler always seems to be at the bottom <laughs> of the totem pole. Well, at least I'm not as bad as Hitler. We don't know who Hitler had. But that's what we do. We categorize sin. We put ourselves on a scale that is above those who we believe deserve, uh, those who are below us, they deserve justice because their sin is worse than our sin. But the Bible makes it so incredibly clear that all have sinned and all have fallen short of God's standard and that the punishment, the payment for all sin, all sin, Ahab's sin, your sin, my sin, the penalty is death. The wages are death. We have all broken God's law. We all... And justice demands that we all die. And we may not think it's fair, but God says, I'm sorry, that's what's just. You break my law. The, the, the natural consequences are death. It's what we deserve. You deserve eternal separation from life and from God. And I deserve the same thing, just as Ahab does. His sin may seem worse than my sin, but we're all in the same boat. We all get the same punishment, death. But because God so loved Ahab, believe it or not, God so loved Ahab. And because God so loved you, because God so loved the world, Jesus made it clear that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him doesn't have to die, but can live forever. Right? And so you see, God didn't just delay justice and punishment and judgment until the time of Ahab's son. 
in reality, God delayed judgment for Ahab's sin and everyone's sin another 800 years until his son came and was nailed on a cross. And that is where God evened the score. God evened the score on the cross by pouring out the punishment and the penalty and the, the vileness of every sin that has been committed, including Ahab's, including ours, on his son so that he would be able to freely and justly give you and me and Ahab what we don't deserve, what we've actively disqualified ourselves from, grace. And all he asks is that we humble our hearts, admit our sin, and trust his son. The lesson we learn from this story really is, I am Ahab. We get really angry at Ahab, but I am Ahab. And while sin demands justice, a humble heart always receives grace. A humble heart always receives grace. If Ahab can receive grace after what he did, can you imagine anything that you could or would do, no matter how many times you've done it, and get so far that if you don't humble yourself and turn to God, you too won't receive grace? It's that big, and it goes that deep. God looks for excuses to shower us with grace. I'm just wondering, what are you going to do with this truth today? How will you respond to this truth. I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond. And we're going to do this. I've never tried this before, so I hope you'll be willing to work with me. But I would like to make this conversation two-way, in, in a way, and also kind of use technology to kind of build the kingdom into our lives. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I'm going to give you a couple options on how to, how to respond. But what I want to ask you to do is I want you to text me your response to this message. We're going to blow my phone up, okay? So I want you to text one of three responses to me, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what these are. But let's say that you are already a follower of Christ. You've been a follower of Christ. You've committed yourself to Him, and you've been walking with Him. And you hear this reality today, and you realize that, you know what? I need to humble my heart. I need, I need to live in a state of repentance. Repentance isn't something I do one time when I receive Christ, but it's something I do every day. I come before God. I humble myself. I say, God, I have broken your law in the last 24 hours. I humble myself. I repent again. Here I am under you. Right? And so if you're a follower of Christ and you would like to say, I would like to recommit myself to to humble repentance, a lifestyle of humble repentance. You know, I've, I've already accepted Christ and all that. I just need to recommit myself to that. And I, I'd encourage you to text one to that number. All right? Now, if you have maybe not ever made that decision publicly, that you have become a Christ follower and that you have never said before, you know, I want to be a Christian, or if you're still not really sure you're ready to do that because you still have so many questions, there are a couple other options I'd like to give you. First of all, Maybe you've never made that decision to, again, publicly declare that I am a Christian, that my sins are washed away and I've been baptized. But baptism is a 2,000-year-old symbolic act that Jesus commanded as a first act of obedience. If you want to follow me, be baptized. It's a way that we are immersed in water as a symbol of our sins wash, being washed away, getting a, a fresh start, a do-over. And if you've never been baptized or it's been so long since you've been baptized, maybe you're a child and you're saying, as an adult, I need to make this decision, then consider being baptized and saying, you know what, if God's grace is this big, I come to Him humbly, I repent, and I give Him the rest of my life. And if that's you, just text 2 to that number. Or maybe you're like, you know what, I've never said I'm a Christian or it's been a long time since I've been in church. Still not sure I'm ready to kind of step across that line. I still have lots of questions about the Bible, who Jesus is, what God is, what this grace thing is. I'm not sure really how it applies to me. I have questions. Well, we're creating an environment for you called Starting Point. It's going to start next month. It's going to be for 10 weeks on Wednesday nights, kind of a small group format where we're just going to bring questions and we're going to, sit, we're going to discuss the questions about faith in a, in a discussion-like format where we're able to build relationships with one another. If you're just not sure you're ready to kind of step across that line yet, and say yes to Christ, but really would want more answers, take the time to get the answers that you need, or at least have that discussion. And that would be the starting point environment. And so I would encourage you to text three if that is what you would, how you'd like to respond today. But listen, when we see injustice, I know, 
It's maddening. We get angry. We don't like stories to end the way Ahab's stories ended. But the reality is, I am Ahab. And you are Ahab. And while justice demands, or while sin demands justice, grace, our humble heart receives grace.